How y'all doing? Uh, for this part, we're going to do spells and bindings. Let's see, this talks about um, magical enchantments in various types of stories, for good or for ill. Um, this is um, one of similar volumes, another one being Magical Justice, which is um, in the mail as I'm doing this video, so hopefully I'll get in time. We'll go over that book, you know, when it comes. So let's see. Well, let's go over the beginning art first. Well, this one's kind of probably the most um, boring one. You just see a bunch of roses and thorns going over the uh, the borders of the page, and to get more and more, and then you know, and then the third one, they kind of go over the, all over the page, and then the last page, it's just a single row. So this is not the most, um, you know. It's not the most interesting of these things, but let's start with the first page here. Uh, chapter 1, Double-Edged Power. Uh, this beginning story is of Tristan and I um, Isolde of Arthurian Legends. I don't know about just one, um, the story so much. I watched a very forgetful movie um, about 10 years ago when I was living in Tonkawa. Uh, here we go. We got an interesting picture here. The caption on the top here. Um, let's see. Get a good view of that. Um, love was foreign to King Mark of Cornwall, but magic might have wedded his heart to Isolt the Fair of Ireland. But um, had not the impa impassioning spell gone amiss on, in Isolt's hand. <laughs> now we keep going here. Oh. And this may not, and of course, as always, these you know, you may not understand the full context unless you're familiar with the stories already. So here we go, Tristan and Isolt again. Um, the means of enchantment were perilous in the hands of mortals. All unknowing, Trist Tristram and Isolt, um, Isolt um, drank the fairy-made wine intended for other lips. The drought um, bound them together for the term of their lives and even beyond. So, but you know the story in the text, yeah, as always, um, it, it, you know it ends and it goes on. You know, we get. You know, a um, little sculpture um, and, a, and, a, um, and a, um, a woman in a maid of ivory. Captured at the bottom corner here. Let me position this. Um, Once wishes came true. Finding women flawed, the Greek sculptor Pygmalion carved an ivory maiden, fair but cold and still. Um, he wished her living, <clears throat> and it continues on. And, to this page, where the, past, um, the caption um, continues, and she was given life. Um, some said the goddess Aphrodite heard Pagmillion's plea and animated the ivory figure with her own loving touch. So, it's good artwork there. Ah. Here we have a painting of a man on a flying carpet. And as I try to focus on the main part, I'll read the section here. On the wings of wishes, in bygone days, objects char um, charged with magic were widespread in the world and could even be bought. Many serve only as trinkets in the treasuries of rich lords. Indian storytellers, for instance, chronicled adventures of three princes who lived in the northern mountains. These princes were brothers and rivals for the same young woman. To, to decide the issue fairly, the sultan, who was her guardian, said that, sent the men on a quest. Each was a tra um, to travel for a year and return with a wonder. He who brought the finest offering would have the princess for his own. One brother, called Hussein, um, journeyed south in the low plain that lay beside the Arabian Sea. He searched a crowd of bazaars at the city of, um, sorry if I can't pronounce this, Vijayanagar, and, uh, and at length found a treasure indeed. It was a splendid carpet, scarlet in color, laced with blue threads and strands of gold. Power had been woven into the fabric, for the carpet could carry its owner where he wishes. Hussein um, paid 40,000 gold pieces for it. When it was his, Hussein sat upon a rug and gave a command, and the carpet trembled to life. It rose above the turbaned heads of the merchants, above the roof city shimmering in the heat, above the green and um, streaming plain, into the clear heights up among the clouds. Rippling, fluttering, hiding the, um, riding the air, the carpet carried Hussein north to his mountains, where he met his brothers and the sultan. Hussein's brothers had found one, uh, wonders as well. One had discovered a tube of ivory. Whoever gazed through it would see any event he wished, far or near. The offering of the other brother was a humble apple, but its um, flesh restored life to the ailing. 
The comparable treasures were evenly matched. In the end, the hand of the maiden was won simply enough by an archery contest among the brothers. Hussein lost. He retired to the wilds to live as a hermit. As for the carpet, the ivory tube, and the apple, they disappeared into the sultan's strong room, never be seen again. <laughs> Interesting. There was so much focus on this guy, yet in the end, he lost. <laughs> Not typical when you read sto stories like this as a kid. Um, let's see. Uh, sum um, summoning a spirit servant. Many elder beings lurk behind humans. Once Arabia, for example, was the home of a spirit race called the Jinn. Said to be the most ancient of creatures, born of fire, they dwelled in hiding, but they could be summoned to provide treasure, as a boy named Aladdin, um, Aladdin discovered. He was an orphan of a poor tailor and lived in the bazaar, supporting himself and his mother um, in the way street urchins did then. Picking rags, begging, and doing errands. It happened that a magician sent Aladdin. Um, I'm sorry, I want to pronounce it Aladdin um, as one pronunciation. We know it as Aladdin. After a tr um, you know, it happened that a magician sent Aladdin after the treasure, an oil lamp, battered, blackened, and wickless. That that was hidden away in a small desert cave. Aladdin took the commission eagerly, but he kept the lamp for himself, thinking that it might be sold for food. His mother sighed when she saw the humble object, but she polished it diligently to brighten it for selling. The rubbing well, was a summons. Flame leaped from the lamp and from the fire rose a genie, blue as a light that formed it. It saluted a boy and called him master. Aladdin asked for food. With a flick of his massive fingers, the genie summoned a banquet served in vessels of silver and gold. Aladdin ate his fill, then sold the cups and plates for cash. But profit was easier to come by than that, as the boy soon learned. Whatever Aladdin wanted, he had only to request. The spirit gave the youth the clothes and um, slaves and jewels of a prince. When Aladdin's heart turned toward the Sultan's daughter, the genie protected him in a maze of court intrigue, so that he would, so he won the maiden and became prince indeed. When Aladdin saw, uh, fought the wars of the Sultan, the genie provided horses and soldiers. And in the end, thanks to the magic of the lamp and his own, own clever use of it, the bizarre boy became first the sultan's um, became first the sultan's heir, then sultan himself. It was said, moreover, that his rule was a wise one. <laughs> Variations of you know a very common legend that we know of. Let's see more text. Ah, interesting one. And. I, only, I I need to find out what the author's name here when he says I just know it's M M, but very common in many of these books. Uh, the lady in the foreground, in the background, a, a man right behind in the caption. In a wild country of Wales, the fairy princess Rhiannon um, sought the love of mortal um, Prince P um, Pywell. Wreathed in the light of her own uh, of her own world, she appeared before him riding a white horse. He followed her, and in the end, took her as his wife. And as we go forward here, ah, a little child looks like a little child in a crib, some claw above through the window, and the caption reads, "From the union of Powell and Rihanna came a fair son. He vanished from his cradle, stolen in the night by a being from the, of the other world. But the people of Powell's court charged Rihanna, the fairy stranger, with murdering the boy." <laughs> And Rhiannon and again, let me um, position this. So it's this glare. A punishment was devised for the fairy. Wearing a horse collar, Rhiannon guarded her husband's gate, confessing her story to passerby and carrying them on her back like an animal. Tragic. Let's see, going forward, oh, skipping a page too much. Let's see. Uh, through four winters, Rihanna endured, but humans were kind as well as cruel. Her son had been found far away. When the foster parents recognized the child as Pywell's, they returned him to the court and thus freed the fairy from her pillory. <laughs> All right. Ancient metamorphoses. Try to position, you know. Nature was changeable when the world was young and magic still at play, surrounded as they were by mysteries. Humans saw evidence of transformation almost everywhere. According to the Greeks, for instance, their sunflower, a kind of marigold, had not always been tied to the soil. The blossom began life as a water nymph um, na named Cly um, Clyde, um, who, 
who one who sorry who one day was cast out of the cool green depths of the sea and onto the sandy island shore entranced by the brightness she rested there and followed with longing eyes the golden globe of the sun as it rode to, rode to heavens then a change came over her. Her mermaid's tail coiled down to the sand, rooting her in place. Her silver hair curled into petals around her around her face, and from her fingers, green leaves grew. By the ninth day of watching, she had become the sun's flower, whose blossom reflected the golden disk and fl um, followed its course um, throughout the, um, each day. Let's see, continuing on up, skipping a page again. I skipped a lot of pages throughout this book. Hard to grip them. Ah, Blood Begotten, an Enemy. And let's see. Guy with, you know, with a spear down below and his, well, what looks like blood. You got flowers coming out of him. To the ancients, the Crimson Enemy was precious, for they believed that its petals were made from the blood of the of God of growing things. It happened this way. Aphrodite, goddess of love, conceived a passion for the god Adonis, who, who he who named him whose name meant simply Lord, whose beauty surpassed that of all creatures, and who ruled the things of the earth for seven months. The pairs were, the pair was lover were level. Ah, sorry, can't read. The pair were lovers. And Adonis, however, grew restless. Despite the goddess's warnings, he went hunting in the wild one day and was gored by a boar. The goddess found him as he lay dying, the bright blood of his wounds spilled in the grass around. She wailed for him, and in, in, her, in her grief and love, she turned the scarlet splashes to the most delicate of flowers, called anemones, or wildflowers, because the wind, op because the wind opened her petals, and the wind blew them um, away all too soon. There were more, more to there. There was more to tell. It was that the Aphrodite begged and you know, the god Zeus to let Adonis return alive to her for part of each year. The plea was granted. Af ever after, Greek women bewailed his um, auto autumnal death and rejoiced for him in the spring, when the blossoming of enemies um, signified his return to life and the renewal of the earth's fertility. We got some people there with some um, part people, part trees. Let's see. Tree guardians um, for a temple. Um, hello, sorry. Let's see if I can position this. Uh, that's just probably going to have to. Uh, no, that's a little better. On a hill in Asia Minor, once near the ruined columns of a temple, there stood an oak in a linden, whose intertwined branches cast a kindly shade for shepherds of the region. In the noon heat, the men rested and told how the trees had come to be. Long ago, the shepherds said, a village lay in the base of the hill. One day, a pair of wayfarers arrived, dusty, footsore, and seeking shelter. They were turned brusquely away. The villagers had no use for strangers. The travelers trudged up the hill. Near the summit, in a reed-thatched cottage, they found a, a welcome at last. The little house belonged to a man named um, Philemon and, and to Bacchus, his wife, both bent and old. Theirs was, um, theirs was a poor house, but they greeted the strangers with shy smiles, f um, freely offering what they had, all of us in soft cheese and cool wine on beechwood cups. A curious thing happened during the meal. Through all drank deeply, the cups remained full, a sign that gods were in the house. It, it was so. One of the strangers was Zeus, lord of the immortals. The other was Hermes, a god of travel, um, travelers and the road. The pair had punishment for the villagers at the foot of the hill. They sent a flood to drown them, but they made the house of Philemon and Bacchus into a temple. With the old people, um, with the old people its priests. And the gods granted the couple's wishes that neither should survive to, um, to grieve for the other. When Bacchus and Philemon reached the end of their lives, leaves sprouted from their gnarled fingers, and their wrinkled flesh hardened to bark. They stood there as oak and linden, shading, you know, pat, um, shading passing shepherds as graciously as they had served the gods. <laughs> Let's see. Quite a number of these. Looks like one, two, three, four more. All right. Um, don't know if I'll skip one of these, but we'll go ahead with this one. 
Watcher on the road. Looks like a lady down, laying down the grass. Along the country lanes of Europe grows a starry flowered plant, um, um, plantain, clinging to the verges of the past as if seeking human company. The Germans of the old times called the plant, um, plantain um, Virgovort, or Watcher of the Road, and in the name lies the story of, of its genesis. A maiden, people said, left her village one night and followed a path into the wood to meet her lover. He never came to her. Throughout the night she waited for the sounds of his footsteps, but all she heard was a hooting of the owls and a sigh of the winds in the trees, and in, this, in a small hour she began to weep. Finally she lay you know, on the path and died. The sun rose. All around her body, green shoots began to grow. By noon, pale blossoms had threaded um, their way through the dark strands of her hair. By evening, the body had vanished into the mass of tiny flowers. They haunt roadsides still, keeping vigil for the lovers who never appeared. <laughs> this was always a weird one when I looked at, through this as a kid. And uh, yes, um, many of you already have this one figured out from Greek mythology, the price of a weaver's pride. In Greek, t in the Greek, if Greek tales are true, the mother of spiders was Arachne, a Lydian maid so sure-handed and um, deft that no craftswoman could match her in spinning or, uh, or in weaving. But Arachne was arrogant. Not, not even the gods could emulate her skill, she said. Not even Athena, protector of all spinners and weavers. It's true that Athena was a patroness of these arts of peace, but she was also the goddess of war, and she lost no time in answering Arachne. She challenged the maiden to a contest of skill. In her offering for the contest, Arachne added impudence to arrogance. She wove a scene that shone an awful creature, part man and part bull, pursuing a mortal woman. This, she said, represented the love, loves of the gods. Athena wove a scene of a mortal man strapped into a harness that supported wings made of feathers. The man had clearly flown too near to the sun, for the feathers were already aflame. This, she said, was an image of human arrogance. Then the goddess destroyed the mortal woman's work, and with her sharp command, the woman herself, by Athena's words, Arachne shrank and blackened, and eight wispy, um, wispy legs sprouted from her body. She sent the remainders of um, re she she spent the remainder of her brief life, as her descendants um, always would, spinning threads from her own bel belly and sh um, shuttling back and forth across the sticky strands to weave herself a web. <laughs> Looks like a silken cocoon there. Let's see, how, how many more do we have of these? I think we just got, wow, three of them. I've got how many of these in a small section. Uh, this is a Chinese tale, but you know, I'm gonna skip some of these because I don't wanna spend too much time. Second Life of Love, another Greek tale. Yeah, this kind of looks like this is kind of hard to picture there. It looks like a couple of half bodies um, up in the starry sky. Starbound beast. Not all of the natural wonders wrought through transformations are found on Earth. A few are in the heavens, notably the great bear and her cub, which prowl the northern skies. Ancient stargazers were fond of telling how they came to haunt the night. A young huntress named Callisto was um, loved by the god Zeus and bore him a son. The child grew to be a fine lad and a skilled hunter in his own right, but the union yielded you know, grief in the end. Zeus's queen Hera was enraged by the liaison and wove a spell of revenge. When the leith huntress had, um, had run, there lumbered a great bear, heavy of haunch uh, with matted fur and slavering jaws. In this form, Callisto found her son in the forest. She trotted toward him and he, naturally enough, moved to slay the mighty creature with a spear. But the pity of Zeus intervened. The god made his son into a second bear and flung the pair into the sky, you know, to glitter forever as stars. Uh, chapter 2, Webs of Enchantment. I think this is a, a tale of a, um, um, a, a, a girl and, her se and several brothers who were turned into the birds. And here we got, looks like John Howe's artwork here. You see on this page, um, one, one person metamorphosing into swans and old, and looks like an older um, 
I don't know if that's an older woman or not, but you got a man right here. All spells had to play their pattern out. The children of the Irish chieftain Lear, condemned to swan shape, regained humanity only when the spell was done. And then they died of old age. Tragic. Ah. You know, interesting picture here of giant, you know, man shaped in front of it looks like burning buildings in the background. But this is from a Hebrew legend, a brute born of clay. Many a tale of enchantment records how primal forces ran wild once they were unleashed. Jewish legends, for example, tell of spell quickened creatures called golems that sometimes grew dangerously independent of their maker's wishes. Golems were human figures molded from clay and brought to life by men schooled in sacred texts. It was said that rabbis animated golems by placing in their mouths parchments inscribed with the name of God, at the same time reciting passages from the scripture. Such rites were once performed as spiritual exercises, demonstrations of the power of the Holy Word. But golems came to be employed for more mundane purposes. The most famous of these beings, the golem of Prague, named Joseph by the man who made him, defended the Jews in the Prague ghetto against the depredation of the Christian neighbors. Because the longer Joseph lived, the larger and more powerful it grew. He was an effective deterrent to, um, to violence. He was also useful as a builder and errand boy. He, he could not speak, having no soul, but he could obey. Like other creatures of magic, however, golems had a willful streak, and their ever-increasing size made them a threat to the very folk they were summoned to serve. So it was with Joseph, who ran amok in the Sabbath Eve for, for reasons no one could determine, leaving the grotto walls with his massive shoulders and leaving a building, buildings ablaze in his wake. He might have brought the entire ghetto to ruin had not his creator caught him, pulled the parchment from his lips, and recited backwards a scripture that had started um, him in, into motion. All that was left um, when the man had finished was a lifeless mound of clay. I got a picture of a woman looking scared. Uh, fearing humankind's increasing power, the Greek god Zeus gave a woman Pandora a casket sealed to mortal eyes. Curious as the god knew she would be, Pandora raised the lid and so loosed, uh, loosed clouds of woe upon the world. Yep, Pandora's box. Moving on here. About halfway through the book here. Uh, the Evil of Morgana Le Fay. Uh, we'll get into this one here. Um, there'll be more about her in a, a particular volume all about um, stories um, to fall of Camelot. Nothing to necessarily tell about this story, but I'll have to skip this one due to time. And an uh, um, interesting picture here. Guy slightly transparent on, on horseback. You, you know, there, believe it or not, there actually is caption up here, and I'll read it here as I focus on this. Um, high was the price for fl um, flouting the terms of enchantment. Because his wife abused his trust, Earl Desmond of Ireland banished from her life to ride forever as a ghost. Of course, to get the context, so you probably have to read the, you know, the main text itself. Alright, moving forward. A uh, picture of a man. And looks like a woman with a dog out in front of his home. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Unwise was the man who betrayed the beings of fairy. When an Irish warrior called um, Eolan abandoned his fairy mistress for a human wife, the fairy ch changed the mortal woman into a hound and turned the animal over to a man who hated dogs. Yep, don't piss him off. <laughs> and of course, on the bottom of this page, there are rats. Yeah, you might know a story about a rat. I know one when I was a kid. Huh. Interesting. Nice two pay you know part page here of the Pied Piper. Let's see if I can back this up a little bit while I read the text. Out of the town of Hamlin scuttled all its rats, lured to their doom by the music of a magic pipe. When the burghers of the town would not pay the piper the price they had promised for his work, he fashioned another deadly tune. <laughs> and here you have a, uh, well, sort of a biscuit. It was uh, 
of a rat well, it looks like raisins in his eyes and of course the main text itself tells him more in detail uh, now I won't go much into this but this one an, an embowed sleeper this is a, um, a a variation telling of sleeping beauty there's um, the child on you know on her day where she's given all these blessings but it's also given her curse. Uh, let's see. Now, there's not much of a spinning wheel. In fact, in the bottom there, you just see some needle and thread where she pricks herself. Of course, you know, as she goes to sleep, you got all the um, bushes with you know, the thorns on it preventing people from going in. Except for one man who would. Oh, get a better view here. So, and some great detailed artwork here. Of course, we all know basically the story of um. Of, of, of the classics like this, of Sleeping Beauty, but it's um, books like this could give you slightly different variations. Oh, what is um so it's that's one of the things you look forward to with this uh deliverance from magic's coil you got you got a young um looks like a young royal woman with a frog with a ball on its mouth obviously the princess and the frog and let's see going on here we got a frog picture on here but more detailed one you got the princess carrying it by the leg. Capture reads, reluctantly bound by her word. A princess took a frog for a bedfellow. In doing so, she fulfilled the terms of an enchantment and released a creature into its human form. Uh, uh, this is the Fiendish Tales of Bluebeard. A fiendish being who married mortal women only to murder, and Bluebeard possessed a golden key that signaled the moment for killing. It began to bleed uncontrollably. <laughs> you know, I looked through pictures like this as a kid, but I didn't thoroughly read them. I just looked through all the art. And it wasn't until I read the Fables comic books that I got familiar with the concept of Bluebeard. Then I picked up this volume from my own collection. And here we got another picture here. It says, A woman named Isabel, no, little knowing that she was a bride of death, used Bluebeard's key to open his secret chamber. She discovered the lifeless figures of her predecessors hanging there and thus learned what her own fate would be. Uh, let's see. Betrayed by the bleeding of the key, Isabella awaited the um, awaited the end uh, that Bluebeard's magic demanded. But love found the power of, um, of the dark. Her brothers, her brothers rode to rescue her. <laughs> now, Eros and Psyche. I will read the small captions to each of the pictures here. Um, the glow of forbidden lamp revealed to, um, to Psyche the true nature of her lover. He was winged Eros, no mortal man, but the god of love himself. And here, let's see. Discovering meant loss. Psyche broke the rule of this spell, so Eros left her and fled into the night. Let's see. Hoping to win her lover back, Psyche braved the underworld, traveling through tunnels rimmed with everlasting frost in search of the land of the land of the dead. Uh huh. Here she finds. Um, in the pit of the border of the river Styx, Caron, the ferryman, waited. Psyche gave him gold coins to take her to Hades. Oh, put the camera a bit. And there we and let's see. Psyche's penance ended at last when Eros found her caught in the spell of the underworld and took her to the heavens as his bride. Nice to know it has a happy ending there. And uh, let's see. Move my camera just a tad bit. Um forest um a forest refuge. Uh, let's see. Ah, oh, this is a variation. This is just a quick telling of Snow White. I'm guessing here. Yep. Yeah, that's what it is. It's got the, step, the evil stepmother, and there's the apple on the bottom, and the princess on the ground. I won't go over this one. 
Now here's a story that um, um, an anime company years ago, Toei, had these um, wonderful little short 30 minute cartoons of, of Grimm's fairy tales. And I did like the version of this story right here that they made. Um, down under a manor house would wound a staircase down to the underworld whose enchantments lured the daughters of the house um, into mortal danger. In the underworld, an, an island castle stood. Ghostly ferrymen took ma fairy, uh, ghostly ferrymen took maidens to it to dance uh, with them there. But once a living knight went unseen to the underworld and thwarted the weaving of death's spell. I uh, got one of a knight and looks like an archer. The un un unwinding of one spell began this way. When King Arthur slew a stag on forbidden land, the beast protector demanded the payment. The answer to the riddle or Arthur's life. Well, obviously Arthur was able to find it, but well, let's see. And more in the court. Let's see. Trying to let's, let's, let's see. She who sold the riddle that saved King Arthur was a repulsive crone. For her fee, she demanded the hand of Sir Gawain, Arthur's matchless knight. Gawain, loyal to his king and generous of heart, paid the price. And of course, she was not all who she seemed. The hag Gawain married was no hag at all, but the fairest of maidens, transformed by magic. By his unfailing courtesy, Gawain fulfilled the spell's terms to free her, and his reward was happiness of a measure few mortals ever knew. Let's see. Now, this one, I won't go through the full story here. I uh, will read the captions on the bottom. On a bitter winter's night, a hag of loathsome um, aspect burst into the hunting lodge of, a war of, of the warriors of Ireland and begged for shelter. Transformed by the kindness of the warrior, um, Diamurid. Sorry, Diamwad. Oh, I can't pronounce that. Diarmuid? Let's see. The fairy. Oh, let's see. Transformed by the kindness of the warrior, Diamuid, the fairy woman took him for her heart's companion. She had learned to love him. Uh, now this picture is a, a nice little landscape, a field in the bottom, and a person doing the, um, work in the fields, castle in the background, but a ship flying up in the sky. When his lady fled. Damuid um, followed her to the shores of the sea. A small boat took him down through the waters of her homeland. Let's see. Reunited with um, his lover, um, Darmuid um, showed her the jewel, jewel drops that he had found and joyfully learned that they, that they could save her. And here we go, there are a couple, it looks like a battleground here. Mighty in battle, Damoed slew every warrior who tried to keep him from the golden cup whose magic would restore the health of his lady. Uh, here we are. Interesting contrast of Red Knight with the, uh, with the, um, <coughs> with the main hero here. An elephant guide appeared in Diarmuid, uh, and, uh, to Diarmuid. And with a warning, the fiery creature showed the way to a spring that gave forth healing waters. While Diamorid watched, his lady drank, and as she drank, her health came to her. But in the same moment, his heart grew cold. The price of such enchantments. Up through the sea waves, Daimor had sailed in an enchantment vessel back to his own world and his own kind, far um, from the princess he had loved. And that's the end of it. And sorry if I didn't read all the stories you might have been interested in, but again, I like to encourage you all to pick up these volumes. They're wonderful reads. Um, if you have any questions about the art or who did the art, I can quickly tell it out through here. And uh, thank you all for watching. That was spell Spells and Bindings. You all have a nice day.